Hey, I'm Alex Rackle from Board Game Co. And this is a video conversation I generally do once a year-ish or so. Although this one's, I always try to have slightly different takes or nuances or ways I'm approaching it. And, and this one's going to be no different in that sense. But it's the idea of there being too many games and what you do as a gamer. And this specifically was motivated by Eric Martin. I was watching Eric Martin over on the BGG channel. Uh, he had a video, a recap of Gamma Expo 2024, uh, going over the basically the event. And he's talking about how there were a lot of games that had familiar mechanics, things we've seen before. And he has to remind himself that new games are for new gamers. That was the line he used. New games are for new gamers. That's why it's probably, if I didn't, if I, depending on what happens, it's probably the title of this video, but new games are for new gamers, directly inspired by Eric Martin. Thank you, Eric. It was beautifully put. But the idea of it being that very often new games are coming out and very often new games are rehashing concepts we've seen before. There's iteration, there's adjustment, there's changes, the new names, there's whatever it is. Sometimes there's old names. Sometimes you have, you know, Cusco and Custo and Expeditions and Expeditions and Vienna and Vienna. Sometimes you have repeated names of games, just different conversation. But the idea that when games come out and they bring something to the table, but they also seem familiar in a sense, new games are for new gamers. New people enter this hobby every single year. New people enter this hobby every single day, every single month, all the time. And those people need games. That's the way it works. They need games. Well, they don't need games, but hey, we've been in this hobby long enough. You definitely need games, but they want games. They want to get their hands on, on, on various titles and titles go out of print all the time because a publisher makes the title, they sell the title, demand for that title is, sa is satiated and they move to the next game, unless it becomes an evergreen. Evergreens are a whole different conversation, but outside of evergreens, and if you haven't heard that term, an evergreen is a title that gets reprinted again and again and again, it constantly sells. It's Seven Wonders, it's Small World, it's Catan, it's Stone Age. They constantly get reprinted again and again and again. But outside of evergreens, games get printed, demand gets met, they print a new game, and that new game has an overlap of two different audiences. There's the people who want to try the new thing to see if it's better than the old thing, and there's the people who are just getting into the hobby today. That combination of, of markets is what makes those games come to life. The combination of having people who are entering the market for the first time, and that's their first drafting game. That's their first worker placement title. And the people who are sitting there every single year, day in and day out, trying to find the next best title. But new games are for new gamers. They introduce familiar concepts. They try to do so in different ways. They try to iterate. They try to innovate towards perfection. And they don't always do so. But even if to you they're familiar, even if to you they didn't do anything new, new games are for new gamers. This is a problem I struggle with as a reviewer all the time. As a content creator, it's a constant struggle. It's something Tom Vassell, once we're, referencing, once we're referencing other people, I'll mention this as well. Tom Vassell did a video, The Problem with Being a Board Game Reviewer, and one thing he touched upon is the idea that you have to judge a game in relation to all the other games out there, and you, have to, you also have to judge a game with the idea that it might be someone's first game and first entry to the hobby. Both those things have to be done, and inherently those are both impossible to do. Either a game stands on its own merit, or it's in compared to everything else out there. A frequent problem I have when I'm covering a game, when I say, hey, this is okay, but it didn't really impress me, it didn't do anything new, that might have been your first game, and you might have loved it. You might have fallen in love with the hobby through a good game that I also think is a good game, but for me, it didn't do anything new, and for you, it blew your mind because you've played Risk and uh, uh, Monopoly your whole life until now, and this game gave you something new, something different, something better. And for me, it just felt not innovative, not different. As a content creator, you have to imagine, you have to be able to approach a game, both giving it the, the props, the points for being a good game in its own right, while also acknowledging that there might be better games out there. There might be games that have done this before. It's one of the reasons I try to have recommendations. One of the reasons I try to have final thoughts. And final thoughts, I can be like, this is a good game, and it didn't do anything new for me. Here are other games that I think might have done it better. You have to be able to approach it in both ways, because new games are for new gamers, but very often the people reviewing those games have played hundreds or thousands of other similar games that have already done something new for the hobby. You have to constantly put out new things in the space in general. That's how companies stay alive. That's how companies keep the doors open. And you have to work on innovating towards something better. That's another aspect in general, which is I'm not trying to sit here and pitch the idea that every single new thing that comes out is just a rehashing of something old. There often aren't. There's often elements of similarities. The more often, the more time goes on, the more you'll see party games with a similar theme, worker placement games that have done something different, the less you'll see innovation of a new mechanic. Ooh, look at that. We're doing deck building, but now you don't shuffle your deck. You simply put it into this card pile as you go. That's cool. It's different. Sometimes it's actually better other times it's just different for the sake of being different because games do want to feel different across a 20 year cycle sure a game can feel basically identical but across a, mar a much lower cycle you have to try to feel as different as possible you you take mechanics that are familiar you shape them into something that is similar and yet different 
This is true of every form of media you've ever seen, every song, every book, every movie, every TV show. There's only so much creativity that can possibly exist in the world, and so you have people constantly churning out more and more and more and more. And so much, of, so much of it falls by the wayside, either experienced and ignored, experienced and rejected, experienced and consumed, but very little of it actually becomes that next hit song, that next movie that everyone's talking about that was so good, oh my gosh, it was actually a twist you didn't see coming because by now you always see the twist coming, it just is what it is. That next TV show that feels like actually worth watching all three seasons or how many seasons there are as opposed to immediately getting boring once you're past the first three episodes because that hook that premise the idea that there's seven strangers on an island and they don't know who each other are and how they all end up here is an excellent hook it's an excellent idea but how well does it actually hold up to the longevity most things don't Media is created, media is put out there on an obnoxious scale from video games, I didn't even talk about video games, but only the best of the best can ever really stand out. It's just the nature of the media cycle and everyone has their own consumers of media. There's those that watch as many movies as possible and there's those that only see the blockbuster hits. There's those that play every single video game they can get their hands on, there's those that hop onto Steam and Steam shows them a 9 out of 10 game, there's 97% of people like it, and they try those. There are those book connoisseurs, if you ever follow any book channels, I've recently been following book channels more because EasyCat is a uh, content creator, at this point we're just going to mention as many content creators as possible, but EasyCat, another content creator who does board game media, also does book media. Every time I see his book recommendations, I'm like, there's books I've never heard of left, right, and center. I've From all the books, like from the hundreds of books I've seen and recommend, I may have recognized one of them. There's a whole world of things out there, but I only know the next thing that was put out by, I don't know, who do I even read nowadays? Uh, I read um, Ken Follett. So I know the next Ken Follett book, and that's basically it. But there's whole worlds of media out there to consume in every industry, even yourself watching this video. By the very nature of the fact that you're watching a board game channel sit here and talk about new games after new gamers and go on this rambling rant about the nature of consumption and production and making new things and innovating, even you being here means you're heavily invested in this world in a way that so many people like you aren't. There are million plus people that have bought Wingspan at this point, and Wingspan is already a heavier game to a degree. It's not a mass market title in the same way. And there's so many of those who have never set foot on BGG, who have never bought backed a game on crowdfunding, who have no real idea of the nature and depth of this hobby. There's always going to be those who consume casually and those who consume something hardcore. And when a new game is made, it's made for a new gamer and it's made for the hardcore. It's made for the people who are there. And it's, and it's also made with the hope that it becomes the next wingspan, the next thing that innovates towards perfection. And this is all just the idea of when you see something new put out and you wonder why did this need to need to exist is because no one knows how to strike gold. No single publisher has an idea of how do you actually strike gold? How do you come up with that thing that lands perfectly? That next Dune Imperium, that next Arc Nova, that next whatever that rises to the ranks on PGG and becomes a game that everyone loves and wants to get their hands on. How do you actually achieve that as a publisher? And the answer is no one knows. Because if they knew it, they'd keep doing it. This idea of how do you make a video go viral. Like, there's this great skit from um, Viva La Dirt League about, you know, Viva La Dirt League, fantastic channel. Now we're going off you know, board game content creators. But Viva La Dirt League has a fantastic video about, like, this little meetup where, like, this, this company goes in and says, we'd like to make, we have a good idea. You should make our video go viral. And he's like, well... Well, how? He's like, well, make it go viral. That's a good idea. We thought of it. Like, they're acting like it's just something you can you can do, that you can you can construct, what is that, flash in a pan. You can make that happen, and you can't make that happen. You have to come up with the best thing you can, put the right effort into it, and see where it takes you. So many games come out every single year, and a few become evergreens. A few get printed again and again and again. A few get hype and buzz and rise to the ranks. And the rest of them are forgotten. For me, I've played... I don't know, I play three to 400 new games a year. New to me games, games I've never played before. And every single year, inevitably, five to 10 of those games really stand out as, oh my gosh, I'm so happy that I'm exploring all these games because I found these games that I am falling in love with. But most of the games are just good. There's nothing wrong with them, they're good, but you can't keep good games all the time, especially not if you have a collection that's, well, all this. You have to choose the best of the best. You have to learn to get let go, which is why we, which is where we come to the part of the video of what do you do as a gamer. And the first thing is you determine what you want to do as a gamer. Some people want to play everything. Some people want to try as much as possible. And while you can't play everything, if you really want to try, you can certainly do your best to get close. You can certainly do your best to experience as much as possible. Go to conventions, ideally playing games conventions. Try to play as much as you possibly can. Play games on Board Game Arena. It's much easier. Get your hands on whatever games you can. Visit Board Game Cafes or buy or back what you want. There are definitely a large amount of games you can play every single year if you're really trying to. It's not what I recommend doing. 
It's not what I used to do. I always liked trying new things, but I, I had more of a curation in play before I became one of the curators. Once you're in the, that first threshold, once you're reviewing games that aren't out yet, there's less curation. When I'm trying to say yes or no to a game I need to cover, I can't go ahead and see how many other content creators have covered the game and see what their opinion of the game was. I'm saying yes or no as the first wave, and that makes means I have to play more games if I'm doing so for my job. I always like trying new things, but trying new things could have been a hundred games a year versus now trying new things is three to four hundred games a year. It's a different metric, and it's not a metric I recommend. I mean, I, I love my job, make no mistake. I'd rather play a bad game than be staring at spreadsheets, but that is what it is. You have to weigh things up relative to your game time. If you don't have infinite game time, you have to make hard decisions about what you're playing, when you're playing them, with whom you're playing them, which games at which player counts, and so you should be cutthroat about what you want to play. I've talked about this before in other videos. The idea that this is 5,000 plus games come out a year, more than 500 are worthy of your attention just based on their BG score, so how do you possibly eliminate down to a me to a meaningful amount where you can actually just play those games and the answer is be cutthroat number one don't play anything that doesn't interest you if it doesn't pull you in don't waste your time on it and obviously it's different when your best friend comes to you and says hey you know that game it's amazing it's incredible i know you'll love it it's a different conversation but don't force yourself to be pulled into a game just because it exists. Nucleum is a great example of this, and I probably will play Nucleum, don't tell anyone, I probably will get to it. But Nucleum is a game that just hasn't really caught my interest. It's gotten good reviews, it's got it's a great Euro game, it's from known designers. It's a game that I should play, but for whatever reason I haven't been able to muster the excitement of, I need to play this game. And if you're not me, if you're not doing it for a job, just don't. Just don't play the games. Don't force yourself to try to like a game. Don't force yourself to try to be pulled into it. There's no need. There are so many games that I guarantee you will be fighting and competing for your attention no matter what. So first of all, don't force yourself to get pulled into a game. Second of all, and implied to a degree, is make sure that you're only playing games that have stood the test of time. This is a big one. There are so many games that come out every single year and so many games that are well-liked in the moment. But well-liked in the moment and well-liked three years from now are different conversations. You can wait two years. See which games are evergreen. See which games are getting reprinted. Those games have the highest amount of demand or interest around them. You don't need to play everything the year it comes out. If it's a good enough game, it'll be there for you. And if it's not there for you, it wasn't a good enough game. It doesn't mean it wasn't a good game. It means it wasn't a good enough game. So wait and see. I've said this before in many videos, but Terraforming Mars, Blood Rage, Spirit Island, these are all games I waited on. These are all games I saw them come out, I ignored them as as a content creator, I ignored them, and then two years later, when people are still talking with them, I got them, and they are some of my favorite games. But I didn't get them right away. I didn't need to get them right away. They'll be there for you later. If a game continuously has an audience, if it continuously gets reprinted, that is so much more worthy of your time and attention than something that won't even exist, you know, that no one no one cares, doesn't get reprinted, doesn't seem as something to get good reviews. But the tricky part is even when they do get good reviews, they don't always get reprinted either because they're good reviews from a small select hobby of people, small select subset of people. So weight is number one, pay attention to ratings is number two, uh, don't get things that you're not inherently interested in, number three, ask yourself when, with whom, and which, what situation you're playing that game. That's a big deal as well. If you have an excellent looking seven player game and you don't play games with seven players, you're wasting your time. If you don't even play games at four players, if your group is usually, you know, your buddy Bob and your friend Sally and, I don't know, Bob and Sally feel like really old people. Let's go with, um, let's go with uh, uh, Sarah and Andrew. Okay, Sarah and Andrew, Sarah, much better than Bob and Sally. Sarah and Andrew over there, if they're part, if that's your game group and it's always your game group and then every seven weeks, you know, Joe shows up, then at that point, you only have a four player game every seven weeks. So why are you getting a game that works best with four or more players? Mission Critical, Orbit, whatever it is from 3WS Games, fun little game. Basically best as a four player game. If you're not playing a four player game, if you're not gonna get that to the table, don't waste your time getting it. Not to single out that game, one game not to get, but the idea is like find out or figure out for yourself when you back a game, when you buy a game, when you in any way get your hands on a game, try to figure out for yourself where it fits into your rotation. Is it a solo game? How many solo games are you backlogged on? Is it a campaign game? Why do you keep buying campaign games? And I ask myself the same question all the time, make no mistake. The problem is I justify it as part of my job. I, I, I shouldn't even then. I shouldn't. It, it's There's so many campaign games. You have so many campaign games in your backlog. Why are you buying the next campaign game? Ask yourself where something fits into your play schedule. I'm a big fan of aggregator sites. 
BoardGameOfTheYear.org, big site, not sponsored by them, but uh, BoardGameOfTheYear.org, I've talked with them every, uh, whenever it's relevant. They have an aggregation site of showing you the top games based on all the content you play them. What are the very best games out there? By all accounts, Earth is a game you should try. Why? Because it's by, it's so far ahead of all the other games out there as far as a game that has been well-loved, at least in 2023, that you should try it out. doesn't mean it's for you. And honestly, if it doesn't appeal to you, see rule number one and don't get it because you don't need to convince yourself to get a game. There are plenty of games that are going to appeal to you just fine. So many games come out every single year. But new games are for new gamers. They don't have to be for you. You'll find games to love every single year. One of my favorite videos I've ever done on the channel to this day is in the first year of content creation. It's still one of my favorite videos. Is a video called The Hunt for the Perfect Game. And I love that video because to me that video was a justification of the chase. It was a justification of the fact that I keep trying new games because every year without fail I find new games that are incredible. For Northwood, Expeditions, uh, you know, Vindication. There are so many incredible games that I discover every single year. And I wouldn't discover those games if I didn't try to play new games. And so I think there's merit to trying to play new games all the time. I think there is. But I also think that you don't have to play new things all the time. You don't have to try everything right away. You can wait to see how the dust settles. Because the dust will settle. The cream of the crop will rise to the top. It'll still be reprinted a year from now, two years from now, and three years from now. And in the meantime, for most of you watching this video, you have a shelf full of unplayed games that you already know you love, that you keep ignoring while you keep hunting for the perfect new game. As much as I've only found games like Vindication, and Castle Burgundy, and Terraforming Mars, and Blood Rage, because I kept playing new games, I also ignore them more often than I should, because I keep trying new games that aren't nearly as good. Life's an interesting balance of appreciating and enjoying what you have, and trying to improve what you have at the same time. It's an interesting balance. It's a hard one to get right. New games are for new gamers. I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you appreciated this video, and as always, I hope you have a good one.